What is crack lacking, fellow thermonuclear AFers? I am Dan Favalli coming at you with a solo mailbag. It's a Twitter mailbag. I was supposed to do it last week, but I just ran out of time. So thank you, everyone, for your questions. I will be getting to them as soon as we tackle the breaking news. First and foremost, though, the usual reminder, please remember to rate, review, subscribe to us on Apple and Spotify. Those help us out a ton. Also, hit that sub button on YouTube. Uh, even if you're listening via podcast player, like and comment on all of our videos that can help the algorithm love us back. Some of you are really awesome with doing that and we appreciate it. If you've done all those things, tell people about us. Shout us out on Twitter, maybe retweet our promos or just tell people about us. Coworkers, family members, friends, acquaintances, randos on the street who you know like basketball. Join our Discord. The link to that is in the podcast description. Help us continue to build our social channels. Uh, we are at Hardwood underscore Knox on Instagram and at Hardwood Knox on TikTok. Um, and finally you can buy merch. I'm not wearing merch. I said, I'd try and wear hardwood Knox merch as many times as I could, but I've run out. I think I have stickers here though. Yeah. So stickers right here. Maybe I should throw one on my, you can buy hardwood Knox merch that helps us support. You know what? I'm going to, I'm going to stick to this. Oh, I almost ripped the sticker in half. I'm going to put a sticker on my shirt and then I have to find a permanent spot to put it. Let's make sure it's in camera view. So everyone could see just how, how nice and fun these are. Look at that. That hardwood knock sticker right there. So go, you can support the show that way. We really appreciate it. The link to the merch stores in the podcast and YouTube description as well. I think that's all I have for you after 90 seconds of that. And as always, when we're doing these solo mailbags, please, the intermittent pauses. I am honest to God, just time stamping this to make it easier for everyone who's listening back as I just speak right now. We begin though, not with a mailbag question, but uh, Monty Williams is joining the Detroit Pistons after Grant and I said that we both believed he'd be sitting out a year. Uh, because he had three years and 20 plus million left on his deal with Phoenix. And there was also the reporting from Stein that the Pistons tried to get him and he didn't want to be there. He ends up signing a six year deal that's guaranteed. It seems like for $78.5 million, it has the potential to go to eight years and get, and make him over a hundred million or something like that. That is good for Monty. Well, for like great for Monty. Um, glad he's able to do that. Like that's a lot of money. I would assume, or we don't assume, I think Woj or Shams tweeted that he is now the highest paid coach in the NBA. This is probably the largest contract ever given to an NBA head coach, even though their salaries aren't really made public. I don't, you know, even stuff that I've heard through the grapevine or that's actually been reported after the fact, like I don't think Greg Popovich or Expo Elstra is making anywhere near that. Um, there's a lot of money to shell out for Monty, and I respect the Pistons for doing it. Coaching hires do not count against your salary cap. Owners can spend whatever they want on it. They identified Monty Williams as their guy. They went out and got him. I'm excited to see what he can do as just sort of someone to develop um, the kiddies on this roster, um, to be a voice in the locker room and on the sidelines for them. We also, I know he's not necessarily celebrated for his, you know, tactical genius, but the stuff that he ran, there were a lot of com complex pick and roll stuff that Phoenix used to run. He knows how to um, get the most out of his guards specifically. And so I think that should be great for Jaden Ivey, Cade Cunningham. And I think it'll just be great in general. Um, you know, maybe, you know, he has a lot of bigs there, so hopefully they don't go in the way of his relationship with DeAndre Ayton, but not, none of these bigs, even James Wiseman at this point are dealing with sort of the star ego or the, the ego that comes with a max contract, not putting the Ayton Monty stuff solely on Ayton, uh, really interested to see what he could do with this team. And I have, you know, you have to like it. Like you can't do, this doesn't count against the cap. I don't know why you would dislike this move unless you really liked Kevin Ollie or wanted him in there. So from the perspective of the coaching market, though, I think this is really interesting to see if it inflates salaries elsewhere. I do think this was a confluence of circumstances where you're dealing with someone who was incredibly sought after in the first place. And we don't know if he was you know, heavily linked to you know, how much was Toronto actually interested in him. Did Philly give him a long, hard look? Did Milwaukee give him a long, hard look? at all, but this is someone who had better options if you were looking to win now and he was a candidate. And I have to imagine that had he wanted to be involved, the reporting came out later via the athletic James Edwards and um, Shams that Monty Williams had kind of rebuffed overtures, including from the Pistons and other teams saying he wasn't sure he wanted to coach next year, but the Pistons were on his list of teams that he would be willing to come back for. So you have to imagine there's competition there. Um, there's also just in general, like this coaching market, when you're looking at established names felt pretty frothy. You have Nick nurse there and now Monty Williams goes off the board. And then also just knowing how sought after Ime Udoka was, we don't know if teams were uncomfortable hiring him because of, you know, the inappropriate relationship and text messages he exchanged with a female staffer in Boston. That certainly factors into the equation. 
those hires, I mean, were already made, the Udoka one specifically, but like looking at Nurse, that just happened. And the Milwaukee gig was just filled. And so I, I do think that the level of competition coupled with Monty Williams was not, doesn't seem like actively looking to head coach, head coach this year, that it was an offer that he really couldn't refuse and that the Pistons went over the top, you know, came from the top of the rope, threw all this money at him. And I, I so I don't think that this is going to have like a permanent, I don't think Kevin Young or Doc Rivers or Frank Vogel, who are the reported finalists in Phoenix are going to the sun and saying price of the coaching just went up. No, I, I don't see that happening. Ditto for the Toronto job. This could explain though, why maybe he wasn't involved in more heavily in the, Milwaukee or Toronto sweepstakes. Not sure those are organizations that would have been willing to spend a boatload. It's just, I'm blown away by the number, but it's, it's just super cool for Monty. We'll see if this has any impact on the coaching market. I think for names that might be as well-respected as him, where you're looking at someone who has basically, I think he had the highest winning percentage in the NBA since he took over the Suns or whatever it was. Um, Coach of the year winner. This is someone with that track record. And so should Steve Kerr, you know, I think he's entering the final year of his deal or whatever. Eric Spolstra ends in the final year of his deal. Like those are coaches that you could see getting similar fanfare and then money by extension. I don't know that this tilts the coaching market one way or the other, unless it's a sign that, hey, if you're going to latch yourself on to any organization, but particularly one who's in, I don't even want to say the early stages of a rebuild, but even the early stages of the rebuild, but you're at a point in your rebuild where it's kind of unsteady and you're looking now for the results to trans translate in the standings that can create some inherent turbulence instability that you're going to be able to get more guaranteed years and maybe more guaranteed money. I don't think it's going to be six years and, you know, 13 million bucks a pop. I mean, right now, Boyan Bogdanovich, if the salary is flat, if the salary, if the money and the thing is guaranteed, the only Pistons player making more than Monty Williams next year is Boyan Bogdanovich, which is just kind of hysterical. And I'm, you should be totally okay with it. There's no, there's no harm here. So I'm excited to see what uh, his body of work with the Pistons when he gets started and we'll see if, if we'll see how, and if this impacts the, the coaching market at large, we can now dig into the questions. We'll be tackling the finals ones first, have a lot of nuggets and Jokic content. And I mean, look rightfully. So, uh, so we'll begin with, I mean, let's just get this out of the way. Uh, Adam, Adam, Adam one R who's winning the finals. And we'll loop Mark has two questions, but the first one says, what chance do the heat have against Denver in the finals? I will say Grant and I did like a 40 minute segment on heat versus nuggets. So go check that out. It's on YouTube. It's in our podcast feed. If you have not done so already, um, the, so who's winning the finals. We both picked the nuggets. I had nuggets in five. He went nuggets in six. I came very close to going nuggets in six because I have a lot of respect for what Jimmy Butler does. Um, Eric Spolestra, what the heat are able to do defensively. And then there's just Kayla Martin heater that he's on at the moment. Um, when you look at what chance do you give the heat in the finals from Mark's question, if I had to peg it, I think most statistical models have them at like 15 to 25%. I think Grant phrased it the best. We were we were doing the segment. It was towards the end. We did our predictions, and he said, I really believe there's going to be a game, even with Nicole Jokic on the floor, where Jimmy Butler is the best player in said game. And so you can count on the Heat winning one. But if you get two of those games, because let's just say Jokic isn't scoring as much, or he goes – like 11 of 20, which is inefficient for him. That's like nine of 20 or something, which is inefficient for him. And, and Jamal Murray and Michael Porter Jr. Have, you know, th their ups and downs, but their downs and their peaks and valleys, those valleys are hitting on the same night. If you get two of those games where Jimmy Butler is the best player on the floor, this series gets a lot more interesting. If I was looking for a chance to peg it, I would probably land in like the, you have, you have to respect what the heat have done. The adjustments Bellister is going to make, um, you, I don't, I just feel like they've run out of as deep as they've been. And like, they've probably gotten bigger time performances from more people in their supporting cast than the nuggets who are just very much like we're going seven, eight guys deep on any given night right now, but you kind of know you're not searching, I guess, or you're not wondering who's going to be your number two and three as often on any given, like, you know, it's going to come from this set of guys. And it feels like there's more variability involved with Miami, even looking at Bam's offensive performances. Kayla Martin's been great, but will he continue to average 20 points per game on lights out shooting from everywhere? Uh, what are you getting from, I just said, uh, no, Kyle Lowry, he's been all over the place. What are you going to get from Gabe Vincent? Are you going to have a night where Matt Duncan Robinson makes more sense than Max Struess or because Max Struess is a little bit better defensively, they're going to trust him. It feels like they have more questions and they have fewer ways to kind of dictate the style of play here. I think they ultimately will just run out of options defensively 
for how to stop the Nuggets. And we have a question about that specifically, which we will we will get to. Um, so I'm going to give them. I, I feel like this is going to come off as an insult. I've I've picked against them every single series in the playoffs so far. So I'm 0 for three. Heat fans can take solace in that. I think 25 percent, 25 30 percent is fair. And I don't think you know there might be some Nuggets fans that think that's too high. 25 like 70 percent chance of winning the finals is like pretty damn high. And so even if you're saying it's a one in three chance that the Heat have, it's because Jimmy Butler just has one of those classic series, and maybe Bam out of bio puts together his best offensive performance. It could just certainly happen and so i do think it's eminently I, I do think it's possible i don't think it's likely or even close to likely i think the nuggets and they are um by the betting odds they should be overwhelming favorites uh erva asks this is a a great question because i'm not sure it's getting enough the, at least on a macro view that it's getting enough love um but erva asks and this is segueing into nicole Jokic, who have the best postseason um TPAs of all time. For anyone not familiar with total points added, TPA, it's from NBA Math. Adam founded the site. Uh, I was the deputy editor there when we when we did content other than written content other than Hardwood Knox. Hardwood Knox is still under um, on the site, so you can go find it there as well. But you can go check out TPA on NBA Math, and it's a catch-all metric, and you can go into the explainer of what it encompasses that just really tries to convey who have been the best players for entire seasons. Um, there's also career TPAs and there's of course it's broken down by postseason. So I excluded this one so far, and I went through the top ten TPAs of all time, and this is going in order. So we'll start first, going all the way to tenth. LeBron in 2018, Tim Duncan in 2003, and if you want that, this is just so it's weird to read it off, but I will. LeBron in 2018 had a 246.3 TPA. Tim Duncan in 2003 had a 226.5 TPA. LeBron comes in at number three in 2016 with a 203.4 TPA. Larry Bird comes in at number four at a 200.1 TPA. LeBron checks in at five, 196.4 TPA. LeBron again uh, in 2009, 189.3 TPA. Jordan in 90, 186.2. LeBron in 2013, again, 178.1. Kareem in ninth, 176.3. That was 1974. And then MJ again rounds out the top 10, 1989, 175.6. I Can we just take a moment and say LeBron appearing on this list, like, what is it, six, six times? Then I go one, two, three, four. He's five of the top 10 TPA seasons. That is, I, I don't, like, I don't even know what you're, supposed to make of that but for Nikola Jokic specifically I wanted to frame this he's routinely breaking these statistical records when you're looking at a game and we've seen ESPN stats and info tweet out all this different stuff about him his TPA right now is hovering closer to 160 that's in 15 games so let's assume he keeps that same pace and if the Nuggets play four against the Heat he'll be over the the 200 mark and so then automatically he's just in the top five with Larry Bird, LeBron, or the top, is that be the top five? Yeah. LeBron, Tim Duncan, uh, and Larry Bird. So those are the three players that populate the the top five because LeBron appears there three times. Yeah, he has three of the top five seasons, four of the top six, just absolutely monstrous. Let's say that series goes, let's say the series goes six games. He'll be in the top three. And he'll be in the top two if it goes the full seven. And that's just assuming he continues his current TPA rate, total points added rate. So Jokic is putting together one of the best individual playoff performances wire to wire of all time. And I think this isn't the only metric that's going to be able to quantify it or try to quantify it. You can look at the numbers and what he's done on his efficiency and you can glean it from that too. But I don't know that we're talking about that. Enough. It's, it's mostly everyone's kind of focusing on, Oh, the De Denver nuggets have arrived. Look at what they're doing. And here we, here's Jokic. Like when it's all said and done, we actually look back how many individual performances have been more effective or been better throughout these playoffs? And there's a likely he's broken the TPA model, which a lot of it because of box plus minus being factored into it and his defensive rebounding that is certainly going to inflate it. Still, when you look at the names that are populating the top 10, Kareem, MJ, LeBron uh, over and over again, Larry Bird, Tim Duncan, they all kind of make sense when you think about it. And Nikola Jokic, he's going to be in there. He's not there quite yet. But he's going to be in there no matter what at this point. He's going to crack the top 10. There's a real chance. I would even probably predict that he gets into the top three or top four at least. And there's a real chance that he gets to the top two. I would probably bet against him having the best postseason performance of all time. 
But if the series goes seven games and he's just putting up these bonkers numbers every single night, um, don't underestimate the job that Nikola Jokic is doing right now because I'm pretty sure that by the numbers, it's going to be one of the three or four greatest postseason individual performances of all time. And it's probably going to, it should be capped in a title. I mean, like, <laughs> like what else are you supposed to, like, we know LeBron who was the, the leading TPA from 2018. Yeah. We know that uh, he was with the Cavs that year. Was that his final se- season in Cleveland? Camera? We know he didn't win the title that year. Um, so this could end in a title as well. And that just would be like the ultimate capper. Um, so I think we just need to remember that. I'm not saying Jokic doesn't get his flowers anymore. I think people by and large understand how good he is, but I don't know that I've seen, you know, they're asking him about being a two-time MVP or being the best player on a title team or what it would mean to win a title or how shocked some people are that the Nuggets are here and that they're favorites and that they were able to dethrone Phoenix despite being underdogs in that series, yada, yada, yada. And then the discussion kind of veers into, I guess I didn't really, (laughs) so it veers into the, we've reached the point where it's, oh, does the Denver Nuggets title deserve an asterisk? because they're going to beat all these play-in teams. So when you look at beating um, beating, uh, beating the Lakers in the, in the last round, you beat an injured version of the Suns, then you're going to beat the Miami Heat, and you beat the Timberwolves in the first round. I, I want to make it clear. I don't, think, I, don't, first, I don't think people who are trying to be genuine in their coverage are actually talking about that. Who, you know, um, Damon... I can't remember his last name on Twitter. It posted something like the NBA is sort of the only league where it turns to like measuring the validity of titles. When you go back to the bubble title and it, I'm just not deep enough into other sports discourse to understand whether that's true. And I, you know, I want to make it clear that I, I don't think that the, for the most part that the reputable people, the people who want to have authentic discussions about the game, give authentic coverage about the game this podcast we're not going to get into the habit of measuring titles unless i feel the need to defend it and to some extent i'm taking the the rage bait here and i i did it on twitter let me see if i can actually um let me see if i can actually bring it up so from chris palmer if anyone just sort of remembers him he used to kind of write i don't even know what the fuck he um does now to be to be honest with you but he uh he was the one that kind of spurred the discussion about it and yeah i'm going to throw it up on the screen for anyone who's watching on youtube tweets if the Nuggets win the 2023 NBA championship, they will have beaten three play-in teams, the Lakers, the, the Timberwolves, the Heat, and a loss cost to the number four Suns, the weakest ring in professional sports history. That is clearly just, like I said, rage bait. I took it. I posted a mini thread on Twitter about it. Uh, but but I will say, I'm going to throw this other one up on the screen for people who um, who might be uh, watching, uh, watching along. There was also a tweet from ESPN stats and information that kind of it, it, that's not what it was saying. I want to make that clear, but I threw it up on the screen. The nuggets are the fourth team to reach the finals and never face a team with a win percentage of 55 or above in that postseason. joining the 56 warriors, the 57 Celtics and the 59 Celtics. And so you're looking at it and you're like, Oh, okay. Like this is, you know, what are we trying to, why else post that other than to kind of incite this discussion? It would be my thought there. And again, I went on a whole rant. I know how the sausage is made. Like I said, I do think there's things, such things as disingenuous and toxic coverage. I don't know what bucket I throw this under, whatever the hell Chris Palmer is trying to do. Yeah, like that is that is certainly there 100%. Um, but the Nuggets are not going to get an asterisk for this title. The, the, the audacity of them to what? Get the one seed, win enough in the regular season to get the one seed and play who's in front of them during the playoffs is on like the audacity of them. That's cowardice. Are you kidding? And let's also like step back for a minute. The Timberwolves were injured beyond reason all season. I still don't know if they would have coalesced into something truly dangerous. Let's just throw them out. Okay. You earned the right to beat that team by being the one seed in the Western conference. Now, if you have a problem in the later rounds, let's remember a few things here. So you get to Phoenix who was not only favored in that series, but they were 12 and one through their first 13 games, playoffs and regular season, with Kevin fucking Durant. And then you go against the Lakers team and LeBron, okay, yeah, they're the seventh seed and they didn't have the best season. They were 12th in the West at one point, blah, 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 blah. Look at how poorly they started. They won basically 67% of their games about after the trade deadline. Did that have more to do with the actual trades or just getting rid of Russ? I don't care. They won 67% of those games. These are not stepping stones that they're facing and okay the heat are a different beast altogether but you can't fault the nuggets have 
no bearing. Look at the teams that they beat to get here, though. I mean, Milwaukee, yes, okay, the Giannis injury. Then you beat a solid Knicks team, which, like, you know, I think Zach Lofraise is beating equals. That's a great way to say it. Then you go and you beat the Celtics, who, yeah, you got, you got up 3-0 on them, almost blew it, but then you don't in the end. And you could say whatever you want about the Celtics. They still got to Game 7 of the Eastern Conference Finals one year after getting to the NBA Finals and coming within two victories of an NBA championship. This Heat team... They were not good. They were like, they had a negative point differential in the regular season. And I think if you polled people in the organization, they're going to tell you that they weren't even as expecting this. But the thing is, is that it's, you can say that this is lucky shooting or they're on a run. This run has now lasted 12 wins, three rounds of playoff basketball. They are not here by accident because they don't deserve to be. And so if you want to twist yourself into a pretzel, just to continue to climb into your butthole by saying that the nuggets deserve an asterisk, or that there's this is a weak championship field, I beg you to just reconsider. And I want to stop short of saying shut the fuck up, but that's how I feel people are actually having this discussion. Again, I want to make it clear. I do feel like I'm yelling at the wall at this point because I don't think the sensible discourse is skewing this way. But to see that stat from ESPN stats and information and then Chris Palmer going on his just dumbass rant, was it was just like, what are we doing here? And it's not just, I'm not even claiming... Well, look at what the media is doing to the Nuggets again. Okay, yeah, this is, I don't, again, I don't think it's the media. I don't think people are actually having this discussion. Maybe First Take does it at some point um, or Undisputed or whatever. But like we did this with this, we, I don't, we did not do this, but this happened with the Suns, for instance, when they reached, we, it happened with the Lakers specifically in the bubble, their title. And then it happened um, with the Suns where it was like, well, look at everyone who was injured. Like, yeah, we don't care that Chris Paul was banged up beyond reason or that Devin Booker broke his fucking nose during that series or that the relative lack of, you know, playoff experience at that point among their you know core players, not named Chris Paul. Yeah, that doesn't matter at all. It was, it was Mikhail Bridges and Devin Booker's, you know, and DeAndre Ayton's first trip to the playoffs and on the NBA finals, Chris Paul's first trip to the NBA finals as well. I just, I'm not here for the Astros. Like winning the championship is hard. You can only play who's in front of you and certainly if you get a more favor favorable bracket because the lakers they were swept but we want to you know there are people who want to build it as a competitive sweep which by the point differential it was but like these teams were there for a reason they were not just these also rands and i think this everything that we've watched to this point has so much more to do with the nuggets than it does the level of competition and you don't get to have it both ways or all three ways where it's didn't we just finish a stretch where the nuggets were vilified because and Jokic himself his mvp credentials were impugned because he couldn't win in the playoffs he played well but he couldn't win and that was because they had all these bodies missing and that their team wasn't complete we're gonna sit here and say oh the suns with kevin durant were a lost cause before the chris paul injury before the deandre Ayton injury at the end of it please come on we're going to say that the Lakers were, you know, we're going to give the Lakers a pass because what they were new to each other. or We just don't think that they were a good team this year, even though they had LeBron James and Anthony Davis when it mattered most. You don't get to have it both ways. If the Nuggets deserve to be, if, if Jokic, if part of the problem for his MVP, two-time MVP case was that he wasn't winning despite missing all these players, you now don't get to poke holes in the championship path that they took after finishing with the Western Conference's best record for the entire fucking regular season. That stuff matters. They earned whatever path they got, and I don't think it's been super easy. That is my rant against nothing, though, and I fully recognize that I might be yelling at clouds here, but I'm either getting ahead of what disingenuous discourse there will be or just kind of the that ESPN stats and info tweet, even though I understand what social made, that rubbed me the wrong way, and then the, the Chris Palmer one, which is, I mean, you talk about ill-thought. I've had some pretty ill-thought, incoherent arguments, maybe even what the one that you just listened to. Let's get to, I think this is the last question we have on uh, Nikola Jokic and, and the Nuggets, uh, sad face, if you're a Nuggets fan, but hopefully you're sticking with us regardless. Kadam asks, how to stop, how do you stop Nikola Jokic? You pray and cross your fingers. I, I, that's, I'm only, I'm, I'm kidding, but I'm like kind of serious there. I do think, and this is with a caveat that I, I don't believe there's such a thing as actually stopping Nikola Jokic. He might have his bad games. Um, but one, he, he doesn't really, even as inefficient nights, just feel like they're wild offensive performances. Uh, I think what the Lakers did for a second in game one that everyone read into and Michael Malone absolutely trolled, where you have a body, and it's not Rui Hachimura, but we even saw it later in the series. You have a LeBron or a Rui that you throw on Nikola Jokic, and then you have an elite 
roamer, paint protector, shot blocker, and like all everywhere, all at once type of guy playing off to come bring help or protect the basket against, you know, the off ball cuts or the other shot makers that are going to be on the floor to do all those things and fill the gaps or again, pitch in with the Nicole Jokic coverage. I think that's the best bet you have of defending Jokic is those two archetype of players. Now the caveat would be the catch 22, whatever you want to call it would be, I don't know that a team exists that has those two players. LeBron's not in his prime. So I don't think you could count him. I thought about the bucks for a second with Giannis and Brooke Lopez. I'm just not sure that I could get there with, I think they would probably come closest, but what you effectively need is kind of a bam at a bio and a yes to Kupo on the same team, because then you have bam just on Jokic. And I think he's better in one-on-one -on -one situations where, yeah, he can be super switchable and he'll bust up plays on the perimeter uh, as sort of the low man. That's just not, you know, that's never been his thing. I think even uh, was it the dunker spot, Nikias Duncan and Steve Jones, or was it the low post? One of them pointed out that Bam's just not even much of a rim protector. That's never been his strengths. And we've actually talked about that during the middle of the season on this podcast as well. Uh, and so, I think that's the if you that personnel permitting, which again, maybe the Bucks. I guess you. I guess the Celtics. Just if you had Robert Williams not puking, let's just say, and then you were using Al Horford on Jokic. I don't think you want to use Jason Tatum on him or Jalen. But like, I guess that would be one of the better. So Milwaukee or Boston would be one of the better situations there. In theory, Kavon Looney and Draymond Green or Wiggins, maybe, but now I just feel like we're stretching it too thin. And again, I'm not saying to stop, actually stop uh, Jokic, but to have the best setup possible to make his life difficult. The Clippers, I think they need a different big man other than than Zubats because you kind of run, he's not going to be the roamer. Not, you don't want him going one-on-one -on -one against Jokic. You can go smaller and yeah, I guess between Kawhi and Paul George and Kawhi strong enough to go up against Jokic, but George roaming is not really his thing. Uh, we're just digging into the well here. I think that's your best bet at, I don't even want to say stopping Nikola Jokic, but you're going to be able to slow him down or make his life difficult. I it's like, I don't, uh, is the best way to phrase it. Um, good question. I think that Alex, Bo Eric Spolstra and the heat are asking that same question. I think that the Lakers and I think that the Suns and I think that the Timberwolves were asking themselves those same questions. I think that 29 other teams, in the NBA in general have asked themselves that same question at, at some point. And I think that he is arguably that is even our, I would say undeniably the worst person in the league to double team. I'm tr I just maybe like a Steph um, Jokic is the better passer, but because of like where you might be doubling Steph, that just opens up all sorts of stuff. And the, you know, the pick and roll and the short rolls of Draymond become so easy because of the points at where they're giving you those doubles. But Nikola Jokic's offensive game is, close to it's as close to perfection as you can absolutely get and it's as close to unsolvable as you could absolutely get that'll wrap up the i think that's the last question we have in the nuggets but let's go deeper and see if there are any more this is the second question from mark asking who should enter as the title favorite this year uh mark this feels really unfair because we haven't gone through free agency or the draft or trade yet i would say as of right now i think you need to i think you would have to put nuggets or the Celtics, because as down as people are on them right now, they could make some moves on the margins and just be right back where they were. You could probably talk me into the Bucks, depending on if they're able to do anything and assuming they keep Middleton and Lopez. And I think the Suns, I'd like to see what offseason moves they make. I'm trying to think of teams that are just uber close. There are tons that could come into the conversation later on, depending on trades, free agency, what happens on draft night. I will say, if we're just looking at the rosters as they are now, even with the threat of Bruce Brown leaving, looming, I think it, I would, it would have to be the nuggets for me. And I'm everyone who listens to this podcast knows I've probably been higher on them than the consensus. I don't think so anymore. They're in the finals. And so we should all just be, that should be the consensus. And speaking of, look, we have another nuggets question for nuggets fans who have not tapped out yet. Uh, thanks for sticking with us, but we have another nuggets question coming up right after this. Well, nuggets related, uh, but yeah, so I think it needs to be the nuggets. So in the West, the nuggets, and I would say the runner up is just, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with Aiton and Paul. Paul's older. Kevin Durant gets injured all the time. But having Booker and Durant on the same team, we don't know who the coach is. There's so many questions there. But that offense is going to be thermonuclear as fuck. And I think that they probably the runner up for me. I you, I don't even know if you could talk me the Warriors at this point. I just I can't get there. I just like I can't get there. Uh, so I'm going to say in the West, the Nuggets. In the East, the Celtics and. I would just go with the Nuggets overall. That's not really sexy because the Nuggets are in the finals, but I like, you know, 
it feels like the correct answer right now. Uh, Dusan asks, this is a, it's a fascinating question, but it's morbidly so and ill-timed, I guess, if you're a Nuggets fan. Bruce Brown plays, has played great in the playoffs as six man for the Nuggets. Um, so he's definitely outplayed any contract the Nuggets can give him for next season. What are some teams, what do you think are the best fitting teams that should offer him a contract? Uh, who do you think should offer him a contract? Who are the best fits for him, essentially, is, is the question. I will say, to go into this a little bit on the Nuggets' behalf, they can offer him a little over what the taxpayer mid-level exception is going to be based off the 120% raise they could give him. I don't think that's going to be enough to keep him. This is someone who has earned, I would think, at least mid-level money, so between somewhere in 11 and $12 million. And it wouldn't surprise me if some of the teams with cap space were just like, well, hey, that team might give you four years and 44 or whatever it might wind up being, but we'll give you two years and 36 just to give you the overpay. And like you can reach free agency again. You're not super duper old anyway, and you're making all that money. It wouldn't shock me. And so when I'm looking at you know, fits that I could see, and these are big caveats, where it'd be if they cut salary via trade or if a big free agent leaves. And so we'll start with, we'll just start with these because I'm intrigued. Philly, if Harden leaves, I think makes a lot of sense. And all of a sudden they open up the non-taxpayers mid-level. Does that get you, Bruce Brown? Um, the Suns and Mavs, two teams are probably working with a mini mid-level. Not enough for Bruce Brown. But if the Suns end up cutting salary via DeAndre Ayton trade, Chris Paul trade as well. Uh, if they have the non, if they get to the non-taxpayer mid-level, he's a perfect fit there. Ditto for Dallas. If Kyrie Irving leaves or if they find some way to open up the non-taxpayer mid-level, which they again will only do if Kyrie Irving leaves and, and they could have cap space in that scenario for what it's worth. There could also be sign and trade machinations that still leave them operating over the cap but in the non-taxpayer mid-level territory. More realistic or teams that can actually offer him, you know, you know, let's call it two syllable paydays per a days. Um, that would be three syllable pay. He can get two syllable paid per aid. That's what I meant. These are the teams that I like. I kind of like, and I'll do it in reverse order of what I like. These and there are three of them. I have Indy at three. They feel like they need a bigger wing than him, but just the spacing that they have with Turner and Halliburton there, and then who they like to play if it's Jalen Smith at the four. Um, and they've also just been like, hey, we've run smaller lineups anyway, and Bruce Brown can be a part of that. Can he be your de facto three in a lot of situations, run some backup point guard? I don't know if you always want him defending bigger wings, but I think he could work there. Uh, number two for me would be Utah. They just have, if you're worried about his outside shot, and he, he shot it okay in the regular season, it's dipped in the playoffs. Um, they have the spacing necessary, even with Walker Kessler on the floor, to let him put his his rim pressure on the basket. There could be some size overlap if you want to bring Jordan Clarkson back and Colin Sexton, and you have Akbaji there as well, who's going to be due for more minutes. You could easily fit him in. Like You could just roll that guy out of the two or the three and get, let him take some point card reps from you. And just if you're going to surround him with the level of shooting that you had on the floor this year, I think he makes a huge difference there. And then finally, I think my favorite destination, mostly because they're – feel like they're more ready to compete sacramento kings now things get a little dicey because if you play them with sabonis and fox it does feel like the floor would shrink a little bit but they just need strong perimeter defenders and with the spacing they can roll out in some of their lineups where if you want to stagger him from De'Aaron fox you're looking at having sabonis brown and a bunch of shooting in those staggered units uh or if there are just minutes where same difference like if you have another option at the five maybe if you bring trey lyles back playing him at the five when sabonis is on the bench you run Brown and four shooters out there. There's a lot of spacing there for them. And I think, yeah, they might need more of an OG and a Nobi type on defense than a Bruce Brown. Who's, who's very connective, but I think it's like, you look at some of his assignments during the playoffs specifically, like he's defended his butt off. I think he's been better than he was during the regular season. That would be a team. I would love to see him on. They, they will have the non-tax pyramid level exception. They can also have cap space. And so you're looking at, um, you know, Indy easily should have 20 plus million in cap space, 25 plus, maybe, they can get to 30 if they want Utah, their number really fluctuates. It's like anywhere between 20 and 50 plus million cap space, depending on what they do with Clarkson and Olenek. So they'll have cap space. And then the Kings can get, if they renounce Harrison Barnes and Trey Lyles and all their own free agents in general, they're looking at 20 plus million in space. They can get to more if they find a taker for Rashawn Holmes. You shouldn't need more to get Bruce Brown, but they might be in Bruce Brown territory. Even if you keep Barnes, just if it's non-tax pyramid level territory, that could be where he, where he ends up. Uh, but yeah, he's definitely the Nuggets. If they keep him, it's going to be one of those situations. We saw it with Nick Batum, Reggie Jackson, all in LA. We've seen it with other players in the past where you sign him again, and then he's going to become a free agent in 2024, and you re-sign him using early bird rights, and he gets his payday then. They'll be investigated for that, but you know what? 
take my second round pick if it means Bruce Brown is sticking with me after helping me get to the get to the finals. This next question uh, comes from Jake G. If you are the Hornets, what's the more enticing lineup? Ooh, this is this is interesting. Uh, Lamelo, Scoot, Miles, PJ, and Mark Williams, or Lamelo, Terry Rozier, Brandon Miller, PJ Washington, or Miles Bridges, and Mark Williams. Jake adds, feels like a foregone conclusion. We are bringing Miles back, but personally, I'd prefer the former. I do prefer PJ Washington in all these setups, uh, especially the if you're looking at the the last one. <sighs> this is a great question, and when I was thinking about it a few days ago, again, I did my prep work very long time ago for this, uh, about a week ago for this. I, I want to go with the Lamelo Scoot, PJ Washington, Mark Williams, and I guess you had Miles Bridges in there, regardless. I think it's the latter lineup though, for me would be more intriguing. I just, I like the idea of LaMelo and Scoot, just all the things that they could do in transition. I worry about what happens when you need to kind of slow things down and you will need, I have confidence that LaMelo would like, will just be a good off ball shooter. I need to see more of it from Scoot, but what happens to that offense when they do slow things down? I guess Scoot really gives you that downhill dynamic where he doesn't need a, you know, a huge start. Like he doesn't need to be in transition to put defenses in, rotation the way that Lamella ball can I think he's gotten a little bit better on that but he needs to get stronger going to the basket and just physically um, there's just some weird overlap there I don't love I actually don't love the miles PJ Mark Williams uh front court like I get it um but I think I would much rather see Brandon Miller with PJ Washington and Mark Williams and then you can have Terry Rozier at the two the two or even just go with Gordon Hayward and go super big that's more intriguing to me um and I, I guess you can question, do you have enough creation outside of LaMelo to pitch in? We know that's not Rozier's game. And then it, of course, comes down to, yeah, Mark Williams might have a mid-range jumper. He's not creating for himself or others at this point. It comes down to Brandon Miller and P.J. Washington. I don't think that's P.J. Washington's game. We saw him do a lot of stuff kind of at the the nail, the elbows this year, or more stuff than normal, I should say, because of injuries, because of Miles Bridges' Bridges's absence. Uh, so, and the other thing with Miles Bridges, by the way, he still has to serve the balance of that 30 game suspension. I think he has 10 games less after pleading, uh, was it no contest, uh, to felony domestic violence charges. So that's something to factor in here as well. I think Brandon Miller though, gives you a chance at getting the extra layer of shot creation, maybe not table setting that you would want, but the extra layer of shot creation to make the Lamello, Terry Rozier or Gordon Hayward, I might prefer the Hayward. I'm not going to lie because there's your secondary creation there, but the LaMelo, Terry Rozier, Brandon Miller, PJ Washington, Mark Williams lineup. I will say if you think Scoot is the better player, the better prospect overall, and I think I lean Scoot Henderson, I'm just drafting Scoot Henderson. If I'm the Hornets, the lineups, we get into that. I, I'm more enticed by what Brandon Miller can do. You need to be sure that he's the guy as a fit on the team. I understand why you would take the swing on Scoot though. And that's where I, I, I end up on, on that matter. Um, I will say, I'm going to apologize in advance for butchering the name on this one. Uh, Ayo Bulela uh, asked, if everyone is healthy, taking into account ability progression and excluding narratives, who wins next season's MVP? This is what I have written down on this from last week. Good question. I would have Nikola Jokic or Giannis. I could be talked into Luka Doncic, and I added tonight hashtag workout video since we saw him running up the steps in, I think it was Slovenia or whatever. I don't know who else you would throw into that equation at this point. And B, does he ever play back to back seasons of 2200 plus minutes? Do you, do we throw him in there? Uh, are the thunder good enough to put Shea Gilders Alexander kind of on that map? I had him, I have him fourth or fifth. I think I had him fourth in my MVP ballot. I can't remember. I had Giannis, Jokic, Embiid, and Tatum and SGA are my top five. And so I think I must have had SGA fourth. Like that would be a nice dark horse. But I think sort of what we could see with Jokic, yeah, he won too. But now people understand, oh, he can be the best player on a title team because one, the Nuggets are either going to win the title or two, they just fucking made it to the NBA finals. Um, and then Giannis, kind of scary to, all right, let's give him a super short, uh, a super elongated offseason relative to what he might be willing to have. Coming off of injury, he has a new coach that he helped pick. There's been just a lot of chatter about the Bucks all of a sudden, how old they're getting in his limitations. This might be narrative based, which I know you weren't looking for in the answer to your question. Just the idea of him coming back next year, I could see him being an absolute terror, even more so than normal. Look, he's always just going to be in the MVP discussion. Luca, I think it comes down to if you bring back Kyrie Irving, does he cannibalize consideration at all? But if the Magic show a great deal of improvement where they go from outside the play in, even if it was a designed decline, uh, to just top three in the West or something that's certainly going to earn him a ton of credentials. And a lot of people just feel like 
he's next up. Uh, and so what am I at? Three candidates, Jokic, Jokic, Giannis, Luka Doncic. I'll throw Shea in there. I just think that he's so central to what OKC does. If they make another sort of galactic leap, that's going to put him on the map. Those would be the four names that I keep an eye out. I mean, there's just so many usual suspects here. Uh, just Jason, just, does Jason Tatum get dinged at all because of how Boston season ends? Joel Embiid will be there if he plays enough, but just as Steph Curry will be there if he plays enough. Are they going to play enough? Ditto for Kawhi Leonard. I don't think Kawhi Leonard is going to play enough. That'll be by design. Steph Curry at this point, I think that'll be by design as well, although maybe the Warriors just decide to go for it and let him play as many games as possible. So I'll, I'll throw Steph as my fifth there. Uh, I would trust him to play more minutes than Joel Embiid next season. Is that stupid? That might be stupid when you look at the age discrepancy, but I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to frame it that way. You would of course go with a Devin Booker or Kevin Durant and Phoenix. I just feel like those two guys would cannibalize consideration from each other. I don't think I'm really missing anyone. We can get into dark horses where it's like, Oh, imagine if Zion plays in 70 games or something next year. Uh, de- like that's, we're getting into imagine if Kawhi Leonard plays in 70 games territory. Uh, that's a fascinating question. I would like to, of course, answer it after we go through the off season. But right now, if we're assuming good health, um, and that's what I'm assuming is good health, but we also have to recognize, okay, if if we're going, all these players are playing in 82 games, then I'm just going to say Jokic as the answer to that question. So I'm trying to be a little bit more realistic of well, who's going to play the most. I guess some people could be worried about what Jokic looks like off a championship hangover. I'm not really worried about that. We have a Knicks question, and it's not from me, in case anyone was wondering whether I threw a Knicks question into here. K asks, should I, as a Knicks fan, have hope in my heart next season or just kind of stop caring? So I don't know. You shouldn't stop caring. Uh, I, there's hope here. There's a base for something sustainable. I think what they need, and it's a bunch of things. I think, Well, it's a handful of things. I think the biggest thing they need is shooting that can crack their closing lineup. And so this is to say... You can't just go and get a Seth Curry, or you can't just go and even get, let's broker a sign and trade for Gary Trent Jr. I mean, maybe he might be like the, the lowest kind of like the lowest good free agent signing you could get that says, Oh, it might make a material difference. I, I think you need someone who's going to crack your closing lineup. And that's, so you have Julius Randall, Jalen Brunson are in that, I guess Mitchell Robinson, do you consider a lock there? And then it's, okay, who right now? There's at least one other lock. Is it RJ Barrett or is it Josh Hart? Is it kind of both right now? And so those are the five players you're trying to beat out. Maybe even throw Emmanuel quickly, Quentin Grimes. Some of the, You have to have someone who's better than a few of those players. Um, maybe it costs you. <laughs> it's going to cost you some of those players to probably get that player. And I think that's what you really need to be on the lookout for. And I think, look, when we're talking with those players, the only one that should be even relatively close to off limits is Jalen Brunson. And I'm not saying the Knicks have to trade Julius Randle. I would, I think I would argue, and Scott Perry's no longer the GM. Don't know how much this impacts this, but in case anyone didn't catch that, the Knicks did move on uh, from him. His contract was up and now they only have like 87 primary voices in the, in the front office. So let's hope there's not too many crickets. I don't think the Knicks need to trade Julius Randle. I think they need to be more open to it than they inevitably will be. I don't think they're going to view him as someone that they just move. Uh, But I think that's what they need. And so if you're going to just run back the same core, you might still be really solid in the East. Can you cake in more development for Emmanuel quickly? Quentin Grimes, even RJ Barrett with the way that he closed um, the season for the most part. It's like getting into the, the playoff turn. Yeah, you could be better. I don't know that you have the say the the phrase again, galactic leap in you as currently constructed. I think that galactic leap was, okay, we got Jalen Brunson. We got this really good Julius Randle year. Can we count on another all NBA esque version of Julius Randle next year? We haven't seen consecutive Julius Randle campaigns at that level ever. So that's something you have to factor in. I don't think you need to stop caring though. I just, the bar needs to be higher than competence. And I think it's the Knicks have raised that bar. I missed on, Again, it was never the money, but I thought the process behind the Jalen Brunson signing was misplaced, short-sighted, whatever. I was wrong there. So this front office has, or front offices, these front offices within front offices within front offices have proved capable, but now you need to go out and get, and I think you still, I'm going to be honest, I think you still need the best player type of guy where Jalen Brunson should be your number two. So I think that's, going to top your to-do list, but you are at the mercy of the trade market and you shouldn't just go after anybody. And if Towns becomes available, for instance, Carl Anthony Towns. Yeah, he's tempting. Same with Jalen Brown. Are those the guys that you go all in for? I don't know. I probably wouldn't. They're not for me. 
Um, I would have preferred Donovan Mitchell. Like if you weren't going to back up the asset truck for Donovan Mitchell, I don't know why you necessarily do it for those guys. Although the thought of a floor spacing five that tips has to play in towns would be super intriguing, but he would have a coronary with the lack of rim protection there. And so if it's not that, if you're looking at, okay, our best player is still going to be Jalen Brunson next season. You have to find shooting, functional shooting that is going to, you know, preferably can create stuff for himself in the half court when things bog down, as we've seen what the way that Miami went after Jalen Brunson and how Julius Randle can just inherently bog down. But I think you need just more outlets that teams can't pack the paint against you. And it needs to be shooting that can take the form in your closing lineup, which means that they need to defend. They need to be able to work with the ball in their hands. I think Trent Jr. comes close. I know a lot of people are down on his passing. He's a really big gambler on defense, and he's a little bit on the smaller side, um, but he can be disruptive away from the ball for sure. And he's going to get up three pointers. I don't have like a bunch of names to say like, this is who the Knicks should go after. We just haven't seen, it's not going to happen in free agency. They have their non-tax players mid-level. I just don't know who the best player is that gets you. It's not, you know, Dante DiVincenzo would be like sort of interesting for this team, but he doesn't shoot enough or get him in enough. I mentioned Seth Curry before. That's someone who works, but not going to give you much defensively. And you need him to, to stay healthy. And so it's the, the two things that I'm looking at is, is there a star that's worth going all in for that becomes available? And maybe he doesn't check the box of the floor spacing that you want and the functional shooting. But like if Pascal Siakam became available, yeah, I think you need to look at it. And I think a lot of people will see, oh, well, this team could really use OG and OB. And it's, you know, maybe just because they didn't necessarily hang their hats on the defensive end and to have someone like him would be, yeah, be involved in it. That's not who you're pushing your chips all in for. Um, I would say the worst, no, I shouldn't say the worst, but like ideally, if you're going star hunting, your floor should be like a Mikael Bridges type player where someone who might give you more creation than even a Jalen Brown. Like you're going to trust his handle more at that point, better secondary playmaker. I don't know who I'd rather have long-term. I think like Jalen Brown is there. He's younger. I think he's or better. They're about the same age and, and that helps. And he's been has more of a proven track record as sort of a higher volume, accurate three point shooter. But like, those are the, like those guys can make some semblance of sense. I just, I don't even know if either of them are like, it's certainly they're not They're like, they're not the guys that are going to come in and be the best player and nudge Jalen Brunson down to number two. But like, if you, if the Nets decided to shot Mikhail Bridges, yeah, you, I would think you should be in on that guy. Otherwise just looking at shooting, would it just behoove you to go out and look at a buddy healed? I mean, maybe, but who is he playing over in the closing lineup? And that's where just things start to get really, really dicey. And it's almost why, the 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 needs that I'm talking about where it's, oh, you need a best player or you can go after shooting that cracks your closing lineup. There's a chance that it just needs to be sort of one in the same where it's like, okay, how Donovan Mitchell became available. Like who's the next guy that's going to be there? We know it's not going to be Luca this summer. And, you know, I don't, if it is Trey Young, I don't even know if he's necessarily the answer. And you already have Jalen Brunson. So there's Brunson and Mitchell's one thing. Brunson and Trey Young is another. Uh, I think you, you could even argue that the Hawks would probably be asking for Brunson back in that deal. And it's certainly not if Harden leaves. It's not is Joel Embiid that player. Like he fills the best player on a title contender uh, box. Like he checks that. But and yeah, for a big, especially a Knicks big, like he's someone who can step out and pop and hit jumpers. But like is he even the answer? So there's a lot of that's what makes their situation so difficult. And it's not a reason to lose lose hope. I think what they did this season though is, and I think this is the best way to frame it, is more sustainable is more of an accurate harbinger of what they can accomplish next season and something they can actually build off of rather than that 2021 campaign where there, it was almost set up for them to have this precipitous fall. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen, but I also thought that they were for real then. So we'll see. I, I would say, Kay, why don't you have cautious optimism in your heart rather than outright hope? Don't give up, but let's not, it's not all sunshine and daisies because it, there is still the element of it being a, a slippery slope here. This question I've been thinking about for like seven nights or whatever it is comes from, uh, comes from Cade and who says no to this trade. And it's a four teamer. Let me see if I'll try to throw it up on screen actually for, uh, for anyone who is watching. So let's, let's find this on the screen and where is it? I guess I can't find it. So we might have to, we might just have to journey onward. I'll, I'll read it off. It's a four team trade. So I don't want to leave you guys uh, sort of hanging here. It just feels a little bit um, unfair, but 
alas, I can't, I do have it pulled up, so I don't know, I don't know where it is. I guess I just have too many windows open. Um, if I find it, I will throw it up on the screen, but it is a four team mega trade and it is, it's a doozy. And if you can't tell, I'm still trying to, um, still trying to stall to find, yeah, I can't get it up there. So the four team trade from Cade is heat receive Christian Wood in a sign and trade for three years and 68.2 million. The Mavs receive Deandre Ayton and Duncan Robinson. The Suns receive OG Ananobi, Tim Hardaway Jr., and Chris Boucher. The Raptors receive Davis Bertans, Landry Shamit, the number 10 pick from Phoenix, the number 18 pick from Miami, Miami's 2020 or second rounder in 2026 from Miami, and a 2028 second round pick in Phoenix. Um, I think I think the Heat say no to this trade to start. And I think um I think part of that is Duncan Robinson has become valuable all over again that I don't know you would use a first round pick to grease the wheels of, okay, you get him off and then you're, you know, you're, you're hard capping yourself in the form of Christian Wood. And I have found the trade, so I will throw it up on the screen for anyone who is watching and wants to see it. And let's hope that it, you know, the screen actually shows it all. Uh, So it's up there. Anyone wants to go take a look at it. So I think they say no. Like Christian Wood brings a lot of what they need offensively in the half court. He can play independent of Bam. He can play with Bam. And maybe you still do view Duncan Robinson's contract with the three years and it's like fifty-eight million or whatever it is remaining um, as a net negative. So I get it, but I don't think that the Heat are going to give up a first-round pick and car hard cap themselves for a player they know works, especially when there's no guarantee they get Max Strus back, and it could become theoretically a lot harder um, to fit Max Strus in under a hard cap. And Gabe Vincent as well, by the way, after you're bringing Christian Wood. At least right now, you're not subject. If you're not going to spend the mid-level exception, a non-taxpayer's mid-level exception, you're not going to hard cap yourself. And so you can pay them what it takes. The other team that I think says no, the Raptors getting two late first round picks for OG Ananobi. I don't, they're getting off Chris Boucher's money, but that's not a big deal. They need a spicier pick. The number 10 pick is sort of your, the carrot. And when, Landry Shaman steals, obviously, whatever, but Baton's having two years left. I think that's a biggie. Uh, I would rather have Chris Boucher's money on my books. I think they say no. And the Mavs are interesting here. Duncan Robinson could help them out a lot, and his contract's better than Davis Baton's. You're getting off of Tim Hardaway Jr., and you could say, well, do you prefer his deal to Duncan Robinson's? You might. I get that. But you're getting off Tim Hardaway Jr. and Davis Baton's. And then you're getting DeAndre Ayton and you, you, it cost you the number 10 pick. I thought about something similar as to whether the the Mavericks viewed DeAndre Ayton as worth the number one, uh, the number 10 pick. Um, but I, I'd be curious. Three years, a little over 100 million left on his deal brings a lot of what they could use, but you really need to bet on him coming back to his uh, defensive peak, which you know he definitely slipped on that side of the floor for most of this season. And that's a big gamble to make. And so you're doing it while giving up the number 10 pick. I don't, and I love, I like Duncan Robinson's fit. Uh, and so he's more playable than Davis Bertans. I think some people might argue with Tim Hardaway Jr. is more playable than, uh, than Duncan Robinson. And so you are taking some risk there. And then you're also going out. I should confirm that though, that you're going out one year longer on the salaries here. Uh, because Duncan Robinson is on the books for yes another three years at about the it's at a bigger number per year than Tim Hardaway Jr. Or is it the same? It's around 19, 19 million a year on average. Tim Hardaway Jr. has two years left at uh, declining scale, so seventeen point nine, and then it dips to sixteen point two. I think the Mavs probably say no to this. Well, do the Mavs? I, I, the Mavs have a, if they weren't if they didn't have to take back Duncan Robinson, I don't think they'd say no. So I actually think that there are three of these four teams saying no. And Kate, I want to make clear. I actually think this is, is a sort of intriguing uh, proposal, and I, I'm I like what you're trying to do here, and I love OG Ananobi on the Suns, but I don't think if you're and I'll finish with this: the Suns, while OG Ananobi would be a great fit, and I, Tim Hardaway Jr. and Chris Boucher would be fantastic fits. Uh, you're giving up no first round picks. Oh, excuse me. You're giving up DeAndre. You're giving up no first round picks. You're not going to get OG Ananobi for DeAndre Ayton at this point. If that was going to happen, feels like it would have been a possibility last off season in a sign and trade, or if he accepted the trade since he had a veto rights during the the trade deadline before the Toronto Raptors got Jakob Pertle and they were still um, in need of a center. Obviously, you don't have 
DeAndre Ayton going to Toronto here, it would it be simpler to kind of configure a three team structure without, uh, and I don't know how desperately you wanted the heat involved there, but where it's okay. Let's say the Suns are taking back Duncan Robinson and the Mavs are keeping Tim Hardaway jr. And so it's basically DeAndre Ayton and they're sending the 10 pick to the Raptors. If you can reconfigure it that way, I would say, I just don't think that 10 and 18 plus two seconds and then salary filler, let's call, even though Bertans is a net negative. I don't think that gets you OG Ananobi. You need something else. And so it's like, can you get the Mavs to include a, a Josh Green or a Jaden Harvey? And at that point, why aren't the Mavs going after OG Ananobi? They can trade this year's first and then another first after that, that pick. So number 10 plus that Mavs second pick, I think that ends up being more enticing for OG Ananobi. If you could actually get OG Ananobi to the Suns, though, that is my favorite part about this trade, by the way. I think Aiden makes sense for the Mavs. I can see what you're doing with the Raptors here, and I think Wood can make some sense for the Heat. Uh, but OG Ananobi to Phoenix is my favorite element of this trade. I would also say that it is the least likely of it. Second part of this question, um, who else would give up a first or similar value in a Christian Wood sign and trade this this summer? Nobody. Uh, like Milwaukee, if they wanted to go with, like give up Marjan Bochamp and you count that as a first, they're not going to give you a 29 or 20, 30 first for Christian Wood. They also can't sign and trade though. Like they're just so they can't, they're above the second, um, assuming that Lopez and Middleton come back, they're going to be above the second, second apron. They're not going to be able to work within the hard cap. I don't think there's a team like they would have to be getting off some like truly bad money. And I'm trying to think of like some of the worst contracts out there. And even if you thought, oh, the Warriors do it to get off of Jordan Poole, again, they're not going to be able to work within the hard cap here. Chicago is not going to do it, even if they want to use like different things at the five. Do you think like Brooklyn would be that desperate for some offense where they give you just a lower level first that they own? Um, not their, I don't like, they don't own many of their own anyway, and they're not going to give you, you know, any of the the picks that they own from like the Suns. I mean, maybe an imminent one, but they're not going to give you Dallas's pick for sure. That's not a team. I don't think there's a team that would give up first round equity. And it, it comes down to, okay, you're giving up a first round pick because there's this deal that's just so bad, uh, you know, that you want to get like maybe no Minnesota is not, doesn't even have a first to trade. I was going to say, if you want to get off Rudy Gobert's money, that's more tongue in cheek. I don't think that team uh, exists personally. I guess like New Orleans, if they're really down on the CJ McCall- McCollum contract, but I don't know why they, why they would be to that point. So I unfortunately have nothing for either. I don't think there would be a team. Maybe I'm just missing a contract. Like the Hornets don't even have one on their books. Uh, and they certainly shouldn't be willing to trade a future first. Philly doesn't have enough first round equity. Portland, no. Sacramento, no. San Antonio, no. Toronto, no. Utah, no. Washington, definitely no. Yeah, I don't think there's a team that would give up. I think you've, you've come closest with the Heat is where, hey, we're looking to get off Duncan Robinson's money, but then you're hard capped if you're a sign and trade. And I think that that makes things uh, a lot more difficult than a lot of teams want it to, especially when you are giving up first round equity as part of the um, process. This next question comes from Jeremy jazz. Twitter is in heat for Anthony black. That sounds sensual. That's cool. Uh, Anthony black, uh, case and Wallace and Taylor Hendricks. Also, I see a lot of hate for Grady Dick going to the Jazz. Can you give a pros cons for him lining up next to Lowry and Kessler? Also, hypothetically, do this exercise with Luca there via trade. What I'm sorry, what are you giving up for Luca that you get to keep Lowry Marketing and Walker Kessler? So Akbaji, you don't even need to worry about salary matching, but other contracts, and then like eight first round picks at that point, because you're gonna have Luca, your own first round picks are gonna be too good. At that point, you need to dip in and like Dallas has to value Cleveland's draft. It has to value Minnesota's draft. I guess that's not a terrible way to go. So it, imagining the fit, yeah, it would be super fun. I mean, Larry Markin's a pure play finisher. Walker Kessler works well off Luka Doncic. I shouldn't say Larry's a pure play finisher, but he's comfortable in that role. But then he can also do secondary stuff, and he'd be super secondary if Luka's there. Uh, would you be able to generate more off-ball movement than we've seen in Dallas um, with your personnel? I think Larry Markin would be a good start there. I just eight first round picks. Like, is that the number? Is it seven? I don't know how many first round picks you need to give up to get Luka Doncic without giving up Lowry marketing or Walker Kessler. Just that's so hard to do. Um, the first part of this, I don't know what you're necessarily asking for me from the first three. If I had to 
I guess let's look at my preferences among these four. So we'll start with Grady Dick. I don't think, and I have begun my draft prep work for anyone who cares. Uh, I don't like Grady. We'll start there. Grady Dick's size and shooting is still rare. So I don't get the hate. Like you put like the jazz have fielded really spacing lineups all year. Um, you get Grady Dick who can also do the, you know, catch and drive stuff as well. I think the bigger issue, I'm sure, I don't know what jazz fans are saying, but is it because of his defensive limitations? I understand that. And from watching him, like I could see how he would really get torched in certain on ball matchups, but all the experts that I read seem to think that he'll be a good team defender. And then from what I've seen, he's fine. Like guarding the corners, not losing track of those shooters, even if they're, you know, sliding up or down and that he's pretty good at making rotations where he's, you know, the high man more than one pass away and needs to rotate lower. Uh, those things looked fine for me from him. So I think he would be a quality fit. Now of the four, do I think he's the best fit? No, I think he might be my least favorite fit. Like of the four in the jazz, maybe case and Wallace who I can't say his name without thinking about case and protein. Is that, is that weird? Um, but I, I love Wallace's defensive energy and he's the more reliable spacer. There's just like two. I want someone bigger, like a real wing type player, not someone who's six, four, six, three, six, five on the jazz. The fact that he brings so much defensive heat, that maybe helps you. So it's not, Oh, look at him over overlapping with Jordan Clarkson and, and Colin Sexton. If both of them are still there next season, um, I really, I want Anthony black is one of my favorite prospects because he's so smart. He's just huge. And you put the ball in his hands and the decision-making um, that he's displayed. And then what he's going to be able to do defensively. Like this is this someone who can guard four, five, maybe positions. I just worry about his shooting, but it's not as much of a concern on the jazz. So he's at like 30% from three last year is the 70 plus percent clip at the charity stripe enough to get you on board with this idea that he can be a better standstill shooter. I honestly don't know. I think Hendricks might be my favorite one. And Adam Spinell and Caitlin Cooper did a great podcast for the box and one where they went into Jarris Walker and uh, Taylor Hendricks, a great deal. So everyone should go check that out the box and one. And I think spins will be coming on the podcast next week. Maybe I'll solicit uh, draft questions from our discord, join our discord um, to include in there. But is Hendricks my favorite one? Just like, would any team ever score at the rim with him and Walker Kessler in the game? I think a big factor would be, do you trust his outside shooting? He was at 39 plus percent on over 4.5 attempts per game. Uh, I like, I trust it. And his free throw percentage was high enough to where you trust it. Um, but do you trust him to make extra decisions with the ball? Like this is not someone that you want to see taking multiple dribbles. He's not going to continue to, to move the ball. He just is in general, like when you look at his handle, uh, it's not something that he's going to bust out extensively and it's not going to look pretty. And there are times where he either won't go anywhere. You just don't want to see it. So uh, I think he might be my favorite because like, do you need another, I guess if you're losing, jo losing Jordan Clarkson, you could make the case that you want another sort of shot creator type. So if I had to rank these, I'm going to go I'm about to hate myself. Aren't I? I'm going to go Anthony black, Taylor Hendricks, Grady Dick, case and Wallace. And I'm, I'm not sure where to land on the Dick Wallet. I could be talked into either of those guys. Uh, we'll see who the Jazz have. The first pick is that number. That's number nine for them. I think look, they have the juice if they wanted to. Let me bring up the let me bring up the draft order here. Should I let's should we should we throw this up on screen as well? But we bring up the draft order. I feel like the Jazz have the ability to add another lottery pick if they wanted to. Like, what could they grease the wheels of? They're also drafting at 16 and then 28. So does 16 and 28 get you Toronto's 13 and, or even Oklahoma city's 12. I don't know that Orlando would want like a, a third first round pick. They have six and 11. So that might be the cutoff. Does Dallas want to drop down from 10, but so like 10, 12, 13, like it feels like they, if you include another type of first round pick or something small, maybe even forget number 28, but if it's 16 and something to jump up like four or five spots and do you land in, the territory to draft two of these guys. I think I've seen uh, of all of these guys, case and Wallace feels like he might fall the the furthest. Although I should really look, I don't look at, I try not to look at too many mock drafts um, while I'm doing my drafts because those will very easily influence me, but let's bring one up. Uh, let's bring one up here. Uh, yeah. Taylor Hendricks is what I think the most popular pick for the jazz black might go to the wizards at eight. That would make a ton of sense. Yeah. Case and Wallace and Grady Dick would be like, Hey, can we get the pick that oh, they can acquire two of them? Um, like that would be, 
that would be something because I love the fits of these. But yeah, so my ranking would it would still be Anthony Black, probably because I'm higher on him as being the best player of all these guys, followed by Taylor Hendricks. Uh, I'm gonna say Grady Dick than Casey Wallace. I don't feel great about that though, so I apologize if anyone's uh, offended by those picks. Grenade asks, who are the top clutch field goal percentage shooters in the playoffs this year? So I will give you the field goal percentage one. That's not my favorite metric to use, but Jimmy Butler has made more clutch shots than they won the playoffs, if you care. And then I filtered it from, um, I wanted at least a 50 player sample. And so we have a little bit more than 50 players by using this, a minimum of four field goal attempts in the clutch and Bam Adebayo and Aaron Gordon lead in clutch field goal percentage. They're both shooting six or seven from the floor. So 85.7% just raw field goal percentage. If you go into the top clutch, um, like true shooting percentage, which is just going to incorporate free throw shooting, two point shooting, three point shooting. Um, the top five are, uh, and it's the filter I use at least five appearances. So at least five games that went into traditional crunch time, Mitchell Robinson leads the league with 113.6 true shooting. Dark white is two at 106.4 true shooting. Bam at bio is three at 91.3 true, sh- true shooting. KCP is four at 87.5 true shooting. And then Kayla Martin, the goat, is fifth at 85 true shooting. Uh, it's funny that so many of, I mean, and a lot of this is just your sample size is going to build up. So the longer you play, it's better. Um, but four of the top true shooting percentage guys made it to the conference finals and three of the top five true shooting percentage guys, by that metric are in the finals. Again, I think you lower the filters on five crunch time appearances, but Mitchell Robinson had even cracking the list while only appearing in, you know, two rounds of basketball. So, um, but yeah, there's that list. And then finally, from Casey Rogers, is mayonnaise an instrument? My only response to that is this was a rock solid SpongeBob SquarePants re- reference, and I totally respect it, Casey. If you scrolled all the way or listened all the way to the end to hear that, me shout out that question, that reference. Uh, kudos to you. And thank you all for listening. Uh, please remember to rate, review, subscribe to us on Apple and Spotify. Head over, subscribe to YouTube. I do look, I publish th- their clips from the episode, but some of them are organic, short form content. We have shorts going up on YouTube and Instagram and TikTok, follow us all there. And they're, look, they're highly edited. I have really leveled up my Adobe Premiere Pro game. So please don't make me waste all this time for nothing. Go give us views and likes and shares there and join our Discord. The link is in the podcast and YouTube description as if anyone can still see it on the screen, check out our merch shop. There are stickers that you can get, but like, can I bring this closer to the camera for anyone seeing? Look, Hardwood Knox, look at that color scheme, that trippy smiley face. Isn't that, isn't that Hardwood Knox as hell? Just that vibe, I think it is. Until next time, and as always, I leave you with a shout-out to the one, the only, the indelible, Frank Nua Kina.